Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer, and today um, I'll be giving our update on COVID-19 for May 23rd. I'd like to start uh, by acknowledging with gratitude that we are on the traditional territories of the Lokungan-speaking peoples of the Songhees and Esquimalt Esquim uh, First Nations, and I'm very grateful to be speaking to you from this wonderful place today. So today in British Columbia, we have 10 new people who have tested positive for COVID-19, bringing our total to 2,517 in British Columbia. That includes 890 people in Vancouver Coastal Health, 1,244 in the Fraser Health Region, 127 people on Vancouver Island Health Region, 194 people in the Interior Health Region, and 62 people in the Northern Health Region. We continue um, to have active outbreaks in, in our health care system, including 14 long-term care or assisted living facilities that continue to be in outbreak, as well as two acute care facilities. There are no new um, outbreaks in our health care facilities, and uh, we ha now have a total of 540 cases, including 330 residents and 210 staff, and I'm actually very happy to say today it's the first day in some time that we have had no new resident cases uh, to report in our long-term care homes. We do, however, have an additional community outbreak to report today, and this is a, an outbreak at the Nature's Touch, uh, a frozen food processing plant in Abbotsford, and uh, five people associated with that plant have been identified as being positive for COVID-19. Uh, Fraser Health is working closely with the plant to make sure that all of the appropriate precautions are in place, and this one was uh, caught relatively early, and it looks like um, the plant was not ordered to close, but is closed over the weekend to make sure that all of the procedures are in place, and they'll be continuing the investigation um, over the coming days. Um, as we reported yesterday, we also have a se second federal correctional facility that has had a, an identified case. Um, there, that's the um, the Mountain facility here in uh, also in the Fraser region. This was a person who had spent time as well at the Matsqui Federal Correctional Facility. So the ongoing investigation in partnership with Correctional Services Canada and Fraser Health is taking place at both of those facilities and uh, an additional case in a, in a staff member has been identified so far um, and that investigation uh, of course is ongoing. We have uh, 303 people who are active cases around the province right now, and of those, 39 people are hospitalized with eight in critical care or ICU. We have had another two deaths of people with COVID-19, bringing our total to 157 people who have died from this virus. The two were both in a long-term care home in Fraser Health, and again, it speaks to the challenges and the um, devastation that this virus can cause when it gets into our long-term care homes. And it is one of the, the key reasons why we continue to have the, the control measures that we have in place, both in the community to prevent people who are work in facilities, but also in the facilities themselves. And our condolences go out to the families of these two people, to their care providers, and the whole community that mourns their loss. There are now 2,057 people who have fully recovered. That's 82% of the cases who have tested positive here in British Columbia. As we continue to find new outbreaks in the community, this gives us a, a, a chance to pause and, and think. We have, as everybody I hope knows, <laughs> entered our second phase of our restart program here in British Columbia, and this is our first week of that. And it has been a week where people have taken it slowly. But we need to remember that these outbreaks remind us gatherings of any kind increase the risk of transmission. And our public health surveillance needs to continue and will continue to quickly identify new cases and to find those they've been in contact with and prevent transmission to others. We must continue with these phase two restrictions. This is our transition period and we need to watch carefully and do it carefully. 
Yesterday, I amended our order on public gatherings to include gatherings of vehicles as well as individuals, and I know that was a challenge for some people. But really, this is the time where we need to be careful. And even though 50 cars may seem like a small amount and it is a less risky environment, we know that if we get people together, there would be several people in a vehicle. The chances of, of more contact, meaning spread of this virus, is, is very real right now. This is not going to be forever, but right now, and as we're in this transition period and we're watching very carefully as businesses are opening, as we're having more contacts, we need to continue to do that in small numbers. That allows us to, one, prevent transmission of this virus to large numbers of people and getting explosive outbreaks that we have seen in this province and across the country and around the world. It also means that we are much more able to efficiently and quickly find people who were in contact with somebody who may have uh, inadvertently brought it into a setting like this. So I, just to be clear, gatherings of any kind is a risk right now and a concern for those two very important reasons. And we are, of course, watching what is happening with our uh, other provinces across Canada, what's happening in, in the United States, what's happening around the world. And we have seen when people have gathered together, whether it be outside or inside, in a gym, in a religious gathering, um, even birthday parties, when somebody inadvertently comes into those settings with this virus, it can spread very rapidly to others. So we're in that transition phase right now. We know the incubation period is 14 days. We have to watch things carefully over the coming week to two weeks before we start changing anything more. The impacts won't be seen until early next week. I think this is also a, a warning sign that as business is open, we need to be very vigilant to make sure that if we have symptoms or if we see symptoms of any kind in our employees, that we make sure they, they stay away from work and that they're tested. And if we catch these early, we can prevent those transmissions that lead to widespread um, illness in a, in a setting. And we've seen that in a number of the poultry plants. We've seen it in other places, other work settings. So catching it early means that we can respond, we can take that person out of the environment, make sure they get the, the care that they need. This virus does cause severe illness, even in young people, and make sure that the chains of transmission are stopped. The faster that it is we can identify new cases, the easier it is to prevent the spread to others. And in every community across the province, it is the public health teams that are doing this work right now. And our mantra for the next little while is, is incredibly important for us, is to test, test anybody who has any symptoms, and to test people even without symptoms if they're in an environment where they may have been exposed to trace those contacts that they might have had at the time immediately before and while they're ill, to make sure that we can put those people in a safe place so they're not passing it on to somebody else if they develop symptoms, and to track people carefully, people who have the virus, to make sure that they get health care if they need it, but also to track the contacts to make sure that they don't pass it on to others. These people, these teams, our public health teams, are our expert virus hunters in this province. And you may not have ever met them, but they have been here. They're part of our team that has been working to support us across our communities for many, many years. And it's often, we don't uh, often hear of them until we have a major event like this. And our public health teams are made up of, of physicians, our medical health officers around the province, our public health nurses that work in many different settings, from immunization settings to communicable disease um, follow-up, and our environmental health officers and licensing officers. And if you own a restaurant, if you own a food premise, if you own a drinking water system, you will be familiar with our environmental health officers and our licensing officers. They are a critical part of our community, our team that is out there doing inspections, providing advice and education on infection control, helping us in our communities in every setting to make sure that things are safe. And they will continue to do that. They come to our businesses, our homes, 
Um, we, they are the people that call you on the phone. They're the people that make sure that you get into the health care uh, system if you need it, if you're sick. And they make, they're the people that are part of my team, our team, that make sure that we have the things in place to be able to test, trace, and track everybody in our community. They do this every day. And now that we are in phase two, this surveillance in our community and this work of public health becomes even more critical. And through our sustained efforts, we're going to target and tailor our response through phase two and coming into the summer and next fall. I just want to, to put a, a, you know, to make it clear how important the work of our public health teams is. And I've mentioned our public health nurses, our physicians, our environmental health officers and licensing officers. There's also a whole group of people who um, work on supporting our surveillance systems, our epidemiologists, our biostatisticians, our lab workers, and everybody has been working long hours over the last few months to make sure that we're doing the best that we can to keep people in British Columbia safe. The risks of COVID-19 are clear. They're clear here, and they're clear from what we we're watching around the world. And so are the steps we need to take to protect ourselves, our loved ones, our elders and seniors in our communities. So pause and think and move forward slowly, as we are all doing this week. And we need to continue to stay vigilant to make sure that we're staying away from others if we're feeling unwell ourselves, to continue to wash our hands regularly, to keep our safe distances, to cover our, our coughs and sneezes. And we will do this together, and we'll do it by being kind and being calm and staying safe. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. As a reminder to uh, everybody on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question. Please also take your phones off mute. You will not be audible until I call your name. First question the, today is from Andrea Wu, Globe and Mail. Hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I have a question about the safe supply rollout in BC. Uh, we've been hearing that many doctors and nurse practitioners are choosing not to prescribe for this purpose, either because of liability, because there's not enough evidence to support it yet, or because they're just otherwise uncomfortable with doing so. And what that has meant is that some people who could benefit from a safer supply are unable to access the option. So I'm wondering what uh, you would say to these doctors and nurse practitioners, and I'm wondering if there's any work underway to facilitate a broader rollout. Yeah, absolutely. This is an important uh, measure that uh, we have had in the works for some time, as you know, dealing with our overdose crises. And the guidelines that came out to support the safer supply um, really are what we need to, to help people use and socialize. There is a program with the BC Centre on Substance Use leading it to provide that extra um, support for clinicians to be comfortable in prescribing it. But we have to recognize there have been many, many changes over the last few months. And it has been a challenge in some areas to engage physicians into this step and to make sure that they have the knowledge that they need um, to be comfortable in this prescribing. So it is uh, something we are working on through the Overdose Emergency Response Centre and I've been supporting it as well. Um, we need to, we're working with the colleges to make sure that they are comfortable and they support clinicians in being able to um, prescribe appropriately following the guidelines. Um, and I, I will say that we've more than doubled the people who have had access to safe supply. And some of the really important initiatives are the people that uh, uh, recently have, uh, we've been working with in Oppenheimer Park, Topaz Park here in Victoria, um, getting them into a safer, stable um, environment indoors. And p a critical part of that is making sure that they do have access both to overdose prevention services, but also to a safer supply. And that has been a fairly successful program, um, making sure that those people have access um, as they're moved into indoor spaces, um, more safe spaces. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is, uh, you know, making sure that um, that we have the latest uh, evidence to support these guidelines, and we are working on making sure that they are updated and in in keeping with that. Um, and I had another thought, and I've just gone out of my head. If I think about it again, there was one other thing we were working on. 
related to this. Oh, we're looking at uh, uh, making it protocolized so that people can have access without have, uh, having to see a physician necessarily for the prescribing piece. So we do have clinics where um, many people are, uh, are, are able to access um, and that we'd have a very strict uh, protocol that people could enter into the program, be assessed by uh, a nurse or another team member, and then if they meet the criteria automatically have access to the to the uh, medications they need to support them. So those are things that we're working on, and uh, it is, unfortunately, a slower process than we would have hoped. Next question is from Camille Baines, Canadian Press. Hi, Dr. Henry. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on the CDC now saying that the virus doesn't transmit easily uh, from objects or surfaces that it's most, or um, exposure to infected animals, that it's mostly person-to-person -person contact. Um, but that's not what the, what Health Canada has said. Where do you stand on that? Oh, I, I think that's what we've been saying all along, that, that this is this is spread through droplets. When somebody coughs or sneezes or sings or even talks sometimes, um, but and it's when you're in close contact with them and you breathe those droplets in. But it, it is and it can be transmitted, um, as other respiratory viruses can, when you touch a surface that has active virus on it and then you touch your mucous membranes. But I've always said that that's not a very effective way, that the vast majority of transmissions are the people that we're close to and we're spending time and space with. And the importance of washing our hands because if we do touch surfaces, there's not just this virus, but there are other viruses and, and uh, microbes that are on surfaces and making sure that we clean our hands before we touch our face. We don't get infected by having the virus on our skin. Um, that's something that we've always said, um, and I, I'm not sure that it's any different uh, from what I've been reading from the CDC. Um, you know, when we do these laboratory tests, there's a, you know, there's always a little bit of, um, it, it's hard to, uh, it, it's a, um, what am I trying to say? It's not a real environment. And so in the real environment, um, the chances of transmitting the virus through surfaces has always been much less, particularly outdoors. And this is something that we've talked about as well. And there's some good evidence, that, again, uh, from a more of a laboratory setting that shows that UV light is very effective at killing this virus and that it doesn't survive very well outside of the moist environment of a large droplet. And so as soon as it dries out in the wind or the breeze, um, the virus uh, dies off very quickly. So that's again, supports what we've been saying about um, outside being less risky than inside, and uh, that we still need to maintain our physical distance, though, because it is those direct droplets that we can inhale that will make us sick. In terms of animals, uh, yeah, that's um, something we've been following, of course, from the beginning, whether we can pass it on to animals and, and uh, animals can pass it back to us, and particularly looking at companion animals because those are the ones that we have most close contact with, so cats and dogs. And, and it is clear that we can transmit this virus to cats and dogs, although not as effectively to dogs, for example, as cats. And I think there's also been hamsters, there's been tigers in the zoo um, that actually... Uh, acquired their illness from humans who had contact with them who were shedding the virus. Uh, it has always been, um, we, we've, I've not seen any evidence until very recently with the mink farms in the Netherlands about animals transmitting it back to humans. For the most part, it's us giving it to our companion animals. And in a really important, unlike influenza, it does not seem to be transmitted from humans to uh, waterfowl and, and poultry, for example. So. Yeah, that we are learning more every day, and I think that's the important thing. Um, and what we'll be learning about the measures that we're taking to protect ourselves and our communities, and which are the ones that are the most effective and most important um, as we go into the fall when respiratory season starts again, and as we go through the transition of our phase two and our restart over the next couple of weeks. Bethlehem, Miriam, News 1130. Hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks so much for taking my question. Um, so I just want to go back. Uh, you said no new residents at care homes tested positive in the last day. And as you mentioned, this is the first time in a while now. Um, how optimistic are you about this continuing as we move through uh, phase two? 
Yeah, you know, um, from the very beginning, as soon as this virus is found in our long-term care homes, we know that it can be a real challenge to stop it, particularly if, if the first detection is in a resident, because that tells us that there's been some transmission already because we know that we've, we've reduced the number of people that are going into our long-term care homes. It just tells me how important it is as we're starting to have more contacts in our communities, as we're opening businesses up. You know, people are a part of families, and healthcare workers live with others who are now going out in the community, maybe going back to school, maybe going to daycare. So we have to make sure that we are all doing our part to keep the, the community transmission low so that we reduce the risk of it being introduced into any more of our long-term care homes. I'm just happy that most of them are are coming under control now, um, but we're not out of the woods yet with that respect, and we need to be so cautious because, you know, our elders and seniors are precious keepers of our knowledge and of our histories, and we need to do what we can to keep it out of um, those communal settings where they live. Next question is from John Hernandez, CBC. Hey there, Dr. Henry. So it is kind of the first weekend where we're seeing these pubs and restaurants uh, allowed to reopen. And on Friday, obviously, many patios full, lineups kind of around the block, people trying to get in. Uh, just wondering what kind of goes through your mind when you see people, you know, very comfortable, uh, you know, trying to adapt to this sort of new normal. Uh, and then, the, then just general thoughts on some of the spacing and precautions taken by owners of these businesses. How likely are these measures to kind of uh, prevent us or at least minimize that second wave down the line? You know what? I, I thought it was really exciting. I was out for a walk last night and people were yeah, were um, following the, the rules. They were keeping their distance. People were outside um, enjoying each other's company from a distance in a safe way. So I'm, I'm, I think things are going mostly really well. Um, you know, it's been a bit of a transition. I went and got my hair done, <laughs> and we wore masks, and we went through the whole process, and, you know, it takes a little bit of adjusting. But I think we're doing it in a slow and measured way, and, and I'm very grateful for people taking that approach. It is what is going to keep us um, keep us doing okay through these next few weeks. Um, and, you know, the fact that we found an, a, a small cluster of cases in another um, in, in place of employment, um, the fruit packing place, um, you know, that reminds us that this, as we're seeing more businesses open, as we have more employees coming together, we have to remind ourselves about the importance of our keeping our distance from each other um, in our settings of employment and to be really sensitive about um, uh, about it, having symptoms and staying away and coming to get tested so that we can make sure that you do or don't have this disease. Um, you know, that's that's the important thing. And the, the restrictions that we've put in place and why we're doing this so um, carefully and slowly is to reduce the numbers that we have so that if somebody comes into that setting um, and has this virus and is spreading it, they're going to spread it to a small number of people. And we can find them quickly in public health so that we can stop those trains of transmission and not get dramatic increases and in uh, in numbers of people who are infected and then can spread it to others. And I, I think I talked about this last week, but we've been monitoring, you know, the number of contacts that every case has. Um, and this is what we do in public health. We follow up every single person who was in con contact with a case. And before we put these measures in place in March, um, people had many, many contacts. On average, it was around uh, six to eight, but it ranged from having no contacts, which brings the average down, which a lot of people did, you know, people who traveled and came home and didn't have a contact with anybody else after they got sick. But then some people had a lot of contacts in the hundreds, and it was so challenging to find those people. And to be able to find them before they got sick and spread it to somebody else, and another cluster of people appeared. So that's what we're trying to avoid now. After we put the measures in place, the average number of contacts that a case had went down to by more than half to three. And that's where we need to stay. And that's the whole rationale behind these small numbers, you know, big spaces, few faces, so that you're not spreading it to large numbers of people. And, you know, from what we just talked about, they're going to be the people we're closest to, the people we live with, our loved ones, our family, our community. 
and as well in public health, it gives us that fighting chance of being able to find everybody quickly, make sure anybody who's sick gets the care they need, but also make sure that we can find all those people who were exposed before they have the opportunity to transmit it to somebody else. So that's what we need to focus on over the next uh, few weeks. Next question is from Ashley Wadwani, Black Press. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, you touched on this a bit earlier, but I was wondering um, specifically how, or sorry, how outbreaks specifically play into moving ahead to um, phase three or four in BC's restart strategy, um, given that we've entered phase two but are seeing new outbreaks. Um, and I was hoping you could explain the difference when it comes to risks of transmission associated with outbreaks compared to other kinds of scenarios. As well, sorry, are there particular sectors uh, you see more vulnerable to outbreaks uh, in addition to, you know, care homes, prisons, and processing plant-type facilities, uh, which seems to be where most of the outbreaks have been? Right, and and partly most of the outbreaks, I'll start at the end, uh, most of the outbreaks have been in those settings because many of the other settings where we would see outbreaks have been closed down. So that's why uh, I say they serve as a warning to us of how important it is as we're opening up gyms, as we're opening up restaurants, as we're opening up retail stores, office spaces where people had been working entirely from home. We can't just go back to having us all together, you know, 50 people in a meeting together, because those are the settings where we know this virus can be transmitted. So outbreaks tell us um, that the virus is still out there in our community, and where they spread rapidly is when large numbers of people are together in close contact and those droplets can spread between them. So that's the, the, the and you know, you, you brought it up exactly correctly. They tell us, they're a warning to us, that as we're opening up more settings, we need to be more and more vigilant. And they, they provide us with the, the rationale of why it is so important that we continue to minimize our contacts and to have safer contacts. So by having the barriers in place, smaller numbers of people, and, you know, that helps us in public health to be able to find people quickly and to stop these outbreaks before they become large, um, large, rapidly progressing outbreaks with large numbers of people. And so if we look around the world, um, the, the countries that have increased um, contacts and, you know, the, there's a couple of warning systems that we can see. In the United States, there was a number related to church services where somebody inadvertently went into the church service and a large number of people um, became ill and some of them died. So those are the types of things where we, we have to be really careful careful that we continue to have our our spacing, we continue to have small numbers of people in those types of events so that we can find people quickly and we're not exposing large numbers of people. Um, Some of the events that we know uh, in uh, South Korea, for example, where they opened uh, bars and nightclubs and there's now uh, thousands of people who have been exposed because of one person who went around to a number of different uh, events and a number, uh, hundreds of people have already become sick, including including some young people that went back to school and were found to be ill when they went back to a, a, the school setting. And they had to, so that, this is how the, our contacts um, can uh, affect different settings in the community. So really outbreaks are a warning sign to us. They're um, sentinel events, signal events that tell us, okay, these settings, these are the, the workplaces that have been open and this is what can happen. So as we're opening up again, it reinforces the importance of the protective and preventive measures that we're taking across the, across our communities. Next question is from Alyssa Tebow, CTV. Oh, hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, I just wanted to circle back to the food processing plant in Abbotsford uh, quickly. I just had a question as to why uh, the facility was not ordered to close when the community outbreak was detected and whether there are any other facilities that this company also owns that are being looked at. Yeah, I don't know the answer to the second question. To the first question, it's when we do an investigation of every case, and so uh, they, where uh, the cases worked and the contacts they have and how they um, transmitted it between each other. So it would depend on that. And if other parts of the plant 
uh, did not seem to have transmission. And uh, from my understanding, the production area where the processing was happening um, had in spacing and barriers and hand hygiene and all the appropriate measures. So the public health team, our public health inspectors, our environmental health officers who were part of, of assessing and investigating that whole thing felt, uh, felt that they had the right types of measures in place and that the contact had happened in, in uh, the office part of the building, for example. Um, so uh, They have worked with the company to make sure that uh, they take the weekend to do some cleaning, to make sure that everybody is uh, brought up to speed again on the education that they need and that all of the barriers are in place and we expect them to be opened again uh, early next week. So that's a, a reminder of, you know, if you catch these, th um, these events early before there's lots of spread and lots of people ill, then it, it means that you can take you, the, um, the, the interruption to the work of the business is is minimized as well, and we we stop the transmission to others. Next question is from Keith Baldry, Global News. Hi, uh, Dr. Uh, Henry. Uh, you brought up uh, contact tracing. Um, I just wanted to expand on that a little more. Uh, how many people are actually on your team doing that? How many people are they typically uh, contacting? And also yesterday the Prime Minister offered uh, federal resources to provinces to assist in contact tracing. Do you anticipate um, getting some assistance from Ottawa in this effort? Yeah, so this is something that is um, my colleagues in each of the health authorities uh, lead the, the, the public health teams. And so I know in uh, Vancouver Coastal, for example, uh, how most of the health authorities have reorganized uh, the public health teams to respond to uh, COVID has been to put people into um, uh, outbreak response and, and contact tracing. Teams. So there is several hundred people who are doing this in Vancouver Coastal and in smaller populations, smaller The public health teams, but we have been uh, working under the leadership in each of these areas, the leadership of a public health um, inspector or environmental health officer, a physician, and uh, public health nursing. And then we brought in others. So we have brought in medical students. We've brought in uh, some retired people to, to help support the teams, um, physicians and nurses and environmental health officers around the province. The other thing that we have done in uh, the BC CDC is set up a, a nurse hotline to be able to do some of the provincial level contact tracing. So for example, we've had, as you are aware, uh, quite a large number of people who've come back from working in uh, a plant in Alberta where there's been an outbreak. And so we've been managing that centrally and uh, connecting with people from the, the nurse line and then uh, working with each of the health authorities where once we find the person, because we sometimes don't know where in the province they live. So those are the types of things that we're doing now. We are beefing up our uh, teams over the summer because this is going to be incredibly important come the fall when we know we're going to see other respiratory illnesses and there's a probability we're going to see more COVID-19 as well. Right now, we have not uh, needed the assistance um, provided by the federal government. And, uh, you know, these are not medical people, but they are people who know how to talk to people about health issues. They're um, people like from StatsCan, for example. So all of the daily follow-up that d we're doing with cases and with contacts is uh, currently being done by our public health teams in the province. And we have significantly increased the numbers of people, and we'll be doing more of that uh, in the coming days and weeks. Um, I think one of the areas that I would strongly <laughs> encourage the federal government to use that type of important resource is in monitoring of people who come across our international borders. As you know, here in BC, we've been doing that using um, public servants from the 
uh, the public service agency, so people who work in other ministries across BC, and they've been doing an incredible job. We've had over 18,000 people that have uh, um, presented their self-isolation plans and have had contact with uh, um, our teams to make sure that they are following their plans and that they have what they need to be able to safely self-isolate when they've come back into BC from, from outside the country. To me, that is going to be an absolutely critical thing if we, if and when we open up our borders, um, particularly with the United States. We need to have meticulous follow-up of people who are coming across our borders to make sure that they isolate when they get here and that if they have symptoms, they are not passing it on to anybody else here in BC. So that, that's an area that I think we uh, need to beef up and um, we'll be talking, of course, with our federal counterparts about how to do that. Farhan Lalji, TSN. Thank you, uh, Dr. Henry, for taking my question. I wanted to ask you about the three professional sports teams in town, the Canucks, the Lions, and the Vancouver Whitecaps. I know they've all made applications to have their practice facilities fully opened as their leagues return to play. I know a couple of them are open in a very limited fashion. Uh, what's your sense on when they'll be able to open fully so that uh, all their players and coaches can get back, even in a socially distant uh, environment? Yeah, so I, I don't have the the ins and outs of the details of that. Um, that's been worked out between uh, uh, you know between the public health and WorkSafe BC programs to make sure that uh, they follow the guidance. Um, but I do understand that there has been some limited opening, and um, you know that is something that I would see happening as a progression. Again, we are in the early stages of this phase, so I think we need to take our time to do it slowly and carefully and watch what's happening. So. Um, I expect that the guidance uh, that they'll be giving and the plans will be reviewed over the, the coming days and weeks. So it could be as early as, uh, you know, early to mid-June. Next question is from Nick Johansson, Castanet. Hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, here in the Okanagan, obviously, the wine industry is a big part of our economy. Um, I know some wineries are starting to open up, opening up their wine tasting uh, moving into the summer. Just wanted to see if that is something you endorse. Uh, and do you see moving into the summer months uh, a time when you'll be encouraging uh, people to travel within the province, uh, particularly coming to the Okanagan to support some of the businesses here? Yeah, so I, I do think, you know, those uh, um, shops are, are under the same licenses as we see for for um, other uh, retail outlets. And so as long as they have their plans posted and they have them in place to make sure that they're meeting the guidelines that we have around, um, you know, numbers of people and distancing and that sort of thing, uh, I can see them um, being able to open as well. So I don't see that being a, a big issue. As with other retail things, there may be limitations, for example, on tasting and things. So that would have to be worked out to make sure that it meets the criteria. But yeah, I do think if things continue to go well and we take it carefully and we're, we're mindful of the potential for outbreaks and we get to the point in, uh, in the summer, then yes, I, I will be encouraging people to vacation at home in BC to experience what we have here and to support our local communities and businesses. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to maybe getting a break someday. And and, and there's a number of, of places that I would like to go and, and spend a, some time and make sure that um, we can support our tourist-reliant industries as much as we can with local people here in B.C. this summer so that everybody has a fighting chance to get through this together. Um, so, yes, I, I will say the only caveat I have is that we have many communities, uh, small communities, particularly our First Nations communities, who have um, understandably a greater degree of risk and loss that could happen if uh, if this virus was introduced into those communities. And so I would leave it to them to determine whether it is safe for people to travel to their communities. And it is their responsibility and their um, uh, you know, it's it's up to them to determine when that when they're ready for that, if at all, this summer. And it may be that uh, uh, some areas will not be appropriate for us to visit unless we're invited in. So we have time for one more question this afternoon. For any reporters that didn't get to ask a question, there will be a statement 
release later today. For recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the Provincial Health Officer's orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. Last question is from Doyle Potento, Global News. Hi, good afternoon. I'm wondering if BC will rethink its position on statistics and provide numbers for smaller regions or cities instead of just large health authority regions. I know the answer weeks ago was no, but I find it curious that residents in Alberta and Washington State can access the equivalent of per county statistics. And in saying no, privacy reasons were given, but private businesses have been recently named regarding outbreaks. So I'm just wondering, will the province rethink its strategy on giving BC citizens smaller breakdowns? Thanks. Yeah, and um, I, I will say, uh, correct you a little bit there, it's not only privacy reasons. Certainly it is when we have small numbers, like one or two people in a small community, they can be readily identified. So, um, But part of the reason is because uh, it gives people who are not in those communities a false sense of security that they don't have the virus. And as we know, as we've come through this, uh, we have not tested everybody. There have been people in, in communities around this province who have been exposed to the virus, who have been sick with the virus, who have been at home, who have spread it to others. And it's, it's this sense that it's those people over there that have a problem and I'm okay, that we need to be very careful about right now and, and certainly in the last number of months. Um, we are presenting the data by, by Health Authority Region for that reason primarily because it gives you the sense of where in the province we're having the, the force of infection but uh, and the, the fact that it is everywhere right now and we are still in that place where uh, it, you can't say it's not um, in one community because we, we, we just it's um, you know the risk is everywhere and so we all need to take the actions to prevent transmission of the virus. Of course we will continue to provide as much information as we can and more data as we move forward and we are looking at um, whether there are reasonable smaller levels that we can look at as well. I will say that you know if we look across the country um, some of the units that uh, are used are, are quite comparable to our health authority units so it's uh, it's just using a different um, geographic locator. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you. Thank you.